Hi, welcome everyone after busy Thanksgiving week. We are here together at the UTA Planetarium's live stream. My name is Levant Grudemir, UTA Planetarium Director, and Jim Bader, Program Coordinator of the Planetarium, is with me today. As always. And we have here. great news, uh, great updates from the UT Planetarium. Uh, Jim, would you like to take the lead on that update? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, I, we mentioned it uh, a little bit last time. We officially had an opening date of December 4th. But uh, we get to finally announce that, uh, sure enough, December 4th, we'll have four shows on Saturday. Um, and this will continue through the first of the year. So our, our schedule will be 1 p.m. Um, one World, One Sky, 2 p.m. Season of Light. Uh, 6 p.m. we're going to do a new show called Unveiling the Invisible Universe, which I'm pretty excited about. We're kind of working on that today a little bit. Um, and then we'll top it off with a classic uh, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Sounds, Very cool. Sounds good to me. So what a 1 p.m. show is One World, One Sky. This is actually uh, featuring uh, Elmo and Big Bird. Yeah. And uh, they are having a friend from China. It's a great show for young ages, especially um, if you have uh, children ages from 4 to 6, uh, maybe 4 to 7, uh, depending on how, uh, how much they like Elmo and Big Bird. Uh, that's a perfect show. I, I certainly recommend and uh, popular Pink Floyd show. Everybody loves Pink Floyd, right? So you can come to listen the, the, the listen a an album with all the the light and video show. There are great effects. Yeah, it's uh, wonderful. Definitely exciting. It's been too long, and we're so excited to welcome everyone back into the planetarium. That also means, um, uh, yeah, come visit us. You can see us in person. Mm -hmm. Maybe our planetarium staff uh, misses you. And also, uh, if you visited the planetarium before, you will see some uh, changes in the area uh, because what we call uh, the, the, the planetarium street or planetarium circle with the official name is uh, closed to traffic. Uh, it's unfortunate that you will not be able to drive right in front of the planetarium anymore, but uh, they are making a nice park and uh, walking area. Uh, that street is converted into some uh, some area that we can use. That's that's great. Uh, so uh, you will when you come, you will park at the same place. Uh, Maverick parking garage is one of the options, and there are several options out there. Uh, we will we have a big parking information on our website if you would like to get more information. And now, I think the hot news of the. Uh, time is James Webb Telescope. I'm, I'm again, again, okay. <laughs> one more time. No, you know I'm, I'm always kidding, spe I'm skeptical. I, I'm about... really excited about it, but um... <clears throat> and I hear the the, the launch date. Uh, I'm like, you know, oh, there's another launch date on that, uh, which uh, they will probably not meet, but hopefully this time. But. <laughs> You know, don't get excited. I have some actually insider information about that telescope. Probably not meet. Uh, I feel like they have to meet this one. I might be wrong, Levant, but I feel like they have to meet this one. It seems like they are pretty close, but uh, but you know what happened? Uh, yeah. First, they said, uh, you know, the they, they will launch the telescope on December 18. So pushed it to December 22. Not a big deal. I mean, the... Uh, only four days usually when uh, they push some launch window. It mm -hmm. may be just several years. Uh, but uh, when they packed the telescope for the launch, uh, I heard that uh, one of the straps carrying the, the entire yeah. telescope snapped. And that uh, caused a big vibration in the entire package. Mm -hmm. And then they decided to just unpack everything and make sure nothing is damaged during that incident. It seems like physically the telescope seems undamaged, but they need to check to make sure every component is working. So I assume they will push the delay further because of that incident. Um, and they might, I don't know. See, I mean, I saw the go-ahead for fueling, so they're fueling it up. Mm -hmm. Because the the word, you know, the word I 
see on the news is they say launch date is set to December 22. The, the message I received said, said uh, the launch date is no earlier than December 22. So December 22 is the earliest time they can, they can launch the telescope. So um, if you ask why they are so picky about what if something happens during the vibration, if there is anything wrong, can they, can they fix it later? At least, you know, launch and just be done with it. And then if nothing wrong, that's perfect. But if anything wrong, somebody can go there and fix it later. Or maybe telescope have some uh, self capability to fix itself. If they're going to fix it, they have to, they have to get in those, those uh, clean room suits and everything. It would be just a huge mess, right? Well, even fixing at the ground is a big job. Uh, but uh, once the, the James Webb telescope is launched, it is going to be actually completely maintenance free. I mean, even though no maintenance uh, was initially planned for Hubble Space Telescope, it has been serviced four times. Uh, because uh, usually with the satellites, we just launch it and then forget it until they finish their uh, economical time or life uh, because it is hard to maintain satellites you have to go there capture the satellite and you know the, the astronauts needs to do a spacewalk it, it's it's expensive it's it's a big job uh, for telescopes it's even bigger because you have to carry you know, big pieces, something like this. If like there's a meter problem, you have to replace the meter. Probably it's an impossible job in space. Yeah. But this is for Hubble Space Telescope. And remember, Hubble Space Telescope is in very low Earth orbit. Uh, it is not too far. I mean, it is just the distance. You can just go there with space shuttle, no problem, and come back and uh, yeah, spend some money and you are done. But with the James Webb Telescope, it is not the case. So let's take a look at where the James Telescope, uh, James Webb Telescope is going. Can I just call this telescope JWT? Because <laughs> Definitely. it's a, such a long name to repeating after uh, every time. So here is Earth. And for a reference, here is how far the moon is on this scale. And JWT is going into a point called Lagrange 2. So what is that Lagrange 2 point? Lagrange points are actually a very interesting point that is coming from uh, very advanced physics textbooks. They have to do something with the, uh, the, the wave physics of uh, gravity force. So gravity force, as our basic understanding is, it's a pull force, right? So for example, Earth and Sun they both have mass, and by the, the principles of basic physics, Earth and Sun apply a pull force to each other uh, in the amount with the same amount. And uh, that force uh, have, a, you can find a point along the path uh, that the forces are equal. So the Earth pulls a little bit, and the, for, uh, the sun pulls more comparing to Earth. So these are opposite forces, and at one point they cancel each other, so that's an equilibrium point. That means you put something over here, and it stays there forever without spending any energy. Do we have anything over there? Um, in L1? At L1 point. Uh, is I don't... it just an empty point in space, or we have actually something? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. There is actually a satellite, Soho. Uh, oh, Soho is okay, yeah, located yeah, okay. at the Lagrange one point. It is uh, the Soho is designed to observe sun, uh, and you can find the, the sun's uh, actual view. It's actually actual camera uh, with different filters on it, so you can see the sun in infrared. You can see the sun in X-ray, in ultra ultraviolet filter. Very cool stuff. You can actually visit Soho's website at nasa.gov and you can get the latest sun pictures. It's pretty cool. And to keep that satellite in the orbit, uh, you don't have to spend any energy because the forces on the satellite is in equilibrium. Satellite doesn't move anywhere. All yeah, right. Um... This, this, this is very easy to explain. But 
it turns out we find a similar equilibrium point, one in the back, one on the other side of the sun, and one is located at 60 degrees, if we just follow that geometry. Uh, so those points are not easy to explain because we always, you know, we say that the, uh, the forces are between two bodies. And if we, let's talk, talk about L2 points, so the force uh, acting on the object over here by Earth, the Earth's gravity, would be pointing towards the sun. So, um, and also the Earth's gravitational pull force by the sun is also towards the sun. So how come there's an equilibrium? So which force actually pulls this object outwards? We have to look into the, the gravitational waves or the wave property of the, the gravitation to explain that. So this is very complex to explain. Anyway, uh, but this is an, also an equilibrium point. So to L2, where the JWT is going. And it is very far. It is about three times the distance of the Earth moon. And once the telescope is there, stationed, and uh, it starts operating, it will be pretty much unaccessible telescope because you cannot just go there and go to that distance with a space shuttle. I mean, imagine going to the moon uh, with astronauts is a big challenge, still big challenge, and going three times the distance is going to be even challenging. Uh, maybe robotic missions may be possible because we can send robots to all the way to Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Uh, yeah, of course, they can go to James Webb Telescope as well. I found a really cool graphic. I want to just show this off so you can see mm -hmm. the sheer distance is enormous. There's the moon, the Earth, Hubble, and then... <laughs> James Webb, really far away. Yes. And then it's also uh, going to be moving too, right? It's like orbiting. It's doing like a, they call it a, a halo orbit that it does around L2. Mm -hmm. It's yes. kind of wild. You can see it in the other graphic too, but. Yeah. I mean, if uh, Earth, Sun, and the JWT was the only objects in the solar system, uh, it could be stationary on that point, but because of the, all the, uh, the, the influence and tug force of other things like the moon and other planets, it has to go into some uh, uh, you know, orbit around its original point, so it have some angular momentum and keep its orbit. Here's an interesting graphic. That, but this uh, telescope has a long <clears throat> history of the development and launch. <laughs> and I don't know how many times the funding is canceled. I don't know how many times the project overall canceled and resumed. So uh, the, the, after the Hubble, uh, Hubble's launch, it was actually shortly after the scientists said, well, we learned great things with Hubble. So here's my question, actually, uh, which we can discuss later. What did we learn with Hubble? You can't think about it. Uh, you can just tell me a in the lot. comments uh, what do you think about uh, the Hubble's mission? What did because you know the, the Hubble was a big challenge to launch because of the all the people needs to be convinced in the the, the chain of command. Uh, I seen a lot of uh, people at the Congress even before they approved the Hubble te Space Telescope's budget. Uh, we heard these conversations, uh, especially I remember one particular. Uh, comment uh, saying that while we have tons of telescopes on the surface of Earth and they are big in various sizes, why do you need a telescope in space? Why we are spending that kind of money for a space telescope? So think about it. What it's wild. I mean, uh... that we could otherwise cannot learn from the telescopes on the ground. Granted, um... Uh, James Webb Space Telescope is funded by multiple countries. It's a, a huge effort between ESA and the uh, United Kingdom, Canada, U.S., several countries. Um, its total lifetime budget is expected to be about 9.7 billion U.S. dollars. <laughs> and just for the record, Levent, it was originally quoted when when it when they announced it officially. It was quoted at 500 million. 
By the no. way, because you always make the joke, it was it was 1997 when they when they said they were going to be launching this telescope for the first time. They outright. should have launched it at the Black Friday so they could get some <laughs> maybe uh, deals. That's too American. There's too many other countries involved. They wouldn't know what that means. Um, it just blows my mind how long they've been planning this. Um, it was first uh, theorized shortly after. Hubble was launched, uh, or I mean, as Hubble was getting launched, they they basically said we need to have a replacement for Hubble. This is going to be great. What do we build? And it was like first brought into idea in 1989. That's crazy. It's 2021. Oh, wild. Yeah, the things take a you know, long time to. Uh you know, propose, there's a proposal stage, uh, and then uh, somebody needs to approve this proposal. Of course, that somebody or some entity with money needs to approve this proposal. And then after the approval of the proposal, after the budget is allocated, the, the scientists and engineers needs to design and develop and test, which takes, you know, long time. Um, if you remember that uh, famous uh, European Space Agency uh, uh, mission, uh, Philae and Rosetta. Was yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Philae mm -hmm. and Philae. Philae. Yeah, Philae. Rosetta and Philae. I would sure. Say. Yeah. But either way. Uh, yeah, the, I was at a conference uh, and the, the chief engineer was giving presentation about that. And uh, he said just alone, development and testing took 10 years for that uh, satellite to, to get ready in space. So, and uh, before then, there is another like five, six years with the like proposal budgeting uh, and funding allocation stages. And after the development of the mission, it takes, you know, several years for the satellite to go to its uh, the, the destination, which was an asteroid, and then the complete the mission. So basically he said, when he joined the um, the team, or just they established the team to uh, build that project, uh, he was a young new engineer, and he spent pretty much entire career on that project. So taking long, I and mean, some people, I'm sure, with the James Webb telescope too. Uh, first time I heard about this James Webb being launched i was uh, at an international conference in 2008 and i was excited <laughs> about all oh, new telescope is going space because hubble is already old but now hopefully that will happen in 2021 and perhaps so, early 2022 uh, just for context event this is really this is just it's silly there's there was about 13 rescheduling um pushback on the launch it was originally supposed to launch in 2007 mm -hmm. But probably at this international conference in 2008, they were thinking they were going to launch this in 2014. Yeah. It didn't get finished even being built until 2016. So just it's just record. getting old and collecting dust at NASA's garage. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was finished in 2016 and it, mm -hmm. it literally just sat there hanging out. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, this time uh, it is going to happen. So what do you think about uh, what we learned from space? Telescopes. Why we need to spend that kind of money? Um, me I mean, my question is not to you, Jim. Okay. Just to to the audience. Yeah. Please. Why? Why should we? I, All I, right. I, Maybe we should just collect the answers, and uh, if we get any answer, we can discuss in the next video. Yeah. Next we make week. a uh, the whole video discussing it. Maybe. Definitely yes. a possibility. Uh, pretty wild though. It's exciting. <laughs> end of an era of waiting for james webb to get launched mm -hmm. and then we finally get to see it do its thing and uh i don't know what does the future hold what do you do what do you think are there going to be big discoveries or are we going to just see uh more research is it going to be like uh are we going to see spencer things... and hubble mixed which is are what we it is see things slightly better or completely from different uh view it better be better. <laughs> what it is going to like, for example, if I take a look at the moon with James Webb telescope, what's gonna? I mean, first of all, I think we can see the backside, right? Yeah, dark side. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, it'll be really interesting for sure. Its mirror is, j it's like a mirror is three times what Hubble's is, something like that, pretty close. So, 
it's a lot bigger a whole lot bigger and also uh we have another video we discussed what is that honeycombs uh, design uh with the mirrors mm -hmm. why they are designed with this pattern why they are not like just the round or spherical mirrors like they used to be that could be a whole video topic and jim uh, speaking about telescopes i realized uh, we haven't given an update for what's going on in the night sky for a long time in facebook hey good point Good point. Let's, Maybe I think it's time that. for some stargazing so we can say, we can talk about what's going on in the sky. And the first things you notice when you, uh, when it gets dark, still so pretty easy early, to see. Uh, before 5.30, it gets dark now. And after, immediately after it gets dark, you see three bright things in the sky. Uh, though this is pretty cool. Um, the, the lowest one, which is always uh, close to horizon is Venus. Those are all three planets, by the way. Here's the the top one, Jupiter, and the the middle one is Saturn, and here Venus. Venus is the lowest part because it is closest to the sun. And Venus always appear low in the sky. You will not see Venus high up in the sky because it is an inner planet. It doesn't get much separated from the sun from our view. So, uh, but uh, it is lowest in the sky, but the brightest, even though we always see a, um, a phase like the moon phase uh, from Venus. We see a crescent. Sometimes we see a bigger crescent. Sometimes we see a tiny crescent from the Venus, but it is always, most of the time it is crescent. And sometimes it is, it is a gibbous phase too, if it is behind the sun. But always, we never see full Venus. So uh, if you look at uh, the Venus with a telescope, let's say, uh, not JWT, <laughs> hopefully, uh, small telescope or any telescope, you will see it's like you are looking actually a, a, a mirror because the Venus is a cloudy planet, always covered by clouds. And those clouds are pretty reflective and they are acting like mirrors. And you look at Venus with a telescope, you won't see much. You will just see a bright light bright crescent in our case but if you own a telescope or if you have access to a telescope um, it is great to look at to these two um, so the higher ones are again uh, here is jupiter the largest planet of our solar system and here is the second one the second largest of our solar system Saturn and Saturn is famous with its rings because they are great and they are visible from earth telescopes so uh do you know the word jim uh, the planet what what does it mean uh saturn because uh, like the the word planet oh the word planet it's yeah. supposed to mean uh it depends on which language you get a derivative Greek from language. but wandering More. star yeah. or star that could move or something like that yeah wander wanderers or wandering stars so uh, why we call them, uh, or they people, uh, our ancestors call them wanderers, because if you noticed, uh, Jupiter and Saturn were closer together and they were in the constellation. Here's a very faint constellation called Capricorn, and they were in the Capricorn constellation. But Jupiter moved away slightly and now it is in uh, Aquarius constellation. So they move in the sky, not very fast. Uh, you cannot notice the movement in one night. But if you just follow the, the planets night to night, you will see that they are slightly shifting it is its locations uh, in reference to the previous night. So uh, why they are changing their reference? Because they orbit around the sun like we do, and we are moving on an orbit. They are moving in an orbit, of course, their location respect to each other changing all the time. So, uh, of course, this type of solar system model was not known back then. So people thought, uh, well, we don't feel any motion. We are not moving at all. But uh, we realized the entire sky is rotating uh, from east to west direction. The sun is rising from east to west direction. Also moon and uh, pretty much a lot of things are doing the same, same things. Uh, so that was the Earth-centric model 
and uh, people also realize that the stars do not change their respective location i mean they the constellation rise and set but they don't change their shape so they are not moving respect to each other but planets were different the, the planets or bright lights they seen they change slightly change their location every day uh, so then they said well these are stars but wandering stars uh, that's where the planet comes from and if a star has the power to move well then obviously it's a god i mean <laughs> That's why the, the name of the planets are coming from uh, Roman gods, right? Like Venus, for example, Mars. Mars is what, like a devil or? Uh, god of war. God of war. Roman yeah. god of war. It's red, you know, it's just um, red. Uh, More of that blood moon stuff. <laughs> let's not go into the blood yeah. stuff <laughs> Okay. <here>. okay. <laughs> All right, so um, those are the three things you can immediately see in the sky. And also, uh, if you turn into east direction, uh, one of my favorite star cluster, uh, open star cluster, is coming up early. It is called Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. So it is right over here. Uh, it's right above the Taurus constellation. So this is coming from the east direction. It is uh, usually when I see Pleiades, I also would like to see Orion constellation, but it is too low. You cannot see early in the morning, maybe later in the evening. Uh, and this star cluster is very uh, interesting. Uh, you can you know see like pack of stars, and if there is a like a perfect night, perfect vision uh, conditions, and your eyes are perfect you should be able to see seven stars in this star cluster with naked eye. So uh, seventh is usually not possible or, or very challenging. Uh, but again, if, if, if the conditions are great, you can always see. But if you have a, like a pair of binoculars, grab them and take a look because you will see plenty of stars uh, in this star cluster. So what's a star cluster? It's not a constellation. Star clusters are just a group of stars, but different, uh, different than the constellation, they are gravitationally bound to each other. That means they are in the same system. They are not far from each other. But the constellations, stars are most of the time unrelated in space. Uh, they look like a pattern from our point of view, but if you travel to different parts of the galaxy, the constellations we know on Earth will not have any meaning because they will look way different. And again, the stars and constellations are not gravitationally bounded most of the time if they are not like pair of binary stars. But here it is, a gravitationally bounded, a crowded star cluster. So this is a young star cluster. How do I know? Because I see a blue haze around them this is a just a gas surrounding stars and this is something we see during star formations stars are forming still in the forming process plus the blue color is a cool color it tells me something it tells me how hot these stars are so stars are pretty hot because their their color is blue so we yeah. can do a lot of astrophysics by just looking at the star cluster, something like this. So this is pretty cool. Uh, and right below, there is a constellation Taurus uh, that you can also always enjoy. And the Aldebaran is the orange giant star of the, the constellation. It's the brightest constellation in the uh, Taurus constellation. Taurus is, by the way, the bull. That's like a V shape. It looks like the bull, Texas bullhorn or something and uh, it's yeah it's very easy to find in the sky and if you have any questions or any um, uh, topic that you would like to bring please let us know in the comments and we'll get back to you on this next week yeah friday we are on youtube at noon Mm -hmm. with another sky update another episode and next week we are again on facebook at the same time 1 p.m yeah all right and hopefully see uh many of you in person on saturday after a long time yeah, a very long time all right have a great week everyone yeah bye-bye <laughs>